probably has been your experience for quite some time. Uh, this business of, of uh, getting gifts, getting the right gift for the right person, it can be a difficult experience, right? And sometimes folks have to give a whole lot of thought to their gift purchasing, and, and uh, sometimes it's a major ordeal. Sometimes there's a, there's a lot of uh, process in getting particular gifts for particular people that are on our list. But what are you doing in relationship to what you're bringing to the Lord Jesus Christ? What are you bringing to Jesus? What are you presenting to Christ? Not only during Christmas, but what are you presenting to Jesus every day of your life? What's going on in your heart, in your life, in relationship to the Lord Jesus? How do we respond to Christ at Christmas? How is it that we relate to Jesus? And what do we offer to Jesus from our life? I, and I remind you when I talk about our offering something to Jesus, it's not that Jesus is lacking something and that He has needs and we're trying to satisfy and meet that need and, and fill Him up. No, we have the need to give to Jesus out of our own heart and our own life as an expression of worship to the one who is so worthy. And whatever we offer to the Lord, if it is a worthy offering, it is enabled by His grace. Amen. The Lord enables us to give to Him what He is worthy of receiving. What are you bringing to Jesus? Maybe you've checked off your list, everybody in your family, maybe some others that you that you purchased some, some gifts for and you've checked all of that off and you say, well, I'm finally ready. I'm ready now for Christmas because I've gotten everything for everybody that I'm supposed to get and, and now we can do this thing. But are you really ready for Christmas? Are you, are you prepared to give Jesus what you want to be giving Jesus? Are those gifts from your life for Christ, are they ready? Are you ready spiritually to present to the Lord Jesus what you ought to be presenting to the Lord Jesus? Of course, all of you are familiar with the gifts from the wise men in Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look in just a few moments at the text there just very briefly. But as I think about the, the narrative in the Gospels concerning uh, the nativity, the birth of Christ, and, and the different things that transpire in relationship to Jesus. I, I see different ones giving to Jesus spiritual gifts that you and I also should be giving to Jesus. It's not just that the shepherds give a gift. And the angels give a gift. And the wise men Give again. Mary gives again. But the spiritual aspects of their gift to Jesus are to be duplicated in us. And we are to give as Mary gave. And we are to give as the angels gave. And we are to give as the wise men gave. Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's, let's, uh, let's get into that. First of all, as we give unto the Lord Jesus, Christmas and every day and every year, as we respond to Christ who came to be our Savior and Lord, as we give unto Him, we give Him our will. That's what Jesus deserves. Amen. That's what Mary did in our text. Mary gave her will to the Lord. Let's look at it together in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 26 through verse 28. I'm not doing Bible exposition with you this morning as much as I am looking at a main truth from, from three different texts. And we see here in Luke 1, verse 26 through verse 28, that Mary surrendered her will to Jesus. I ask you this morning, is your will surrendered to Jesus? Are you yielded to Christ that He might be in, in demonstration the Lord of your life? He is Lord. 
But are you living in surrender to His authority and to His will, to His plan and His purpose for your life? Have, have you given Him your will? Are you surrendering your will to the Lord Jesus? In verse 26 of Luke 1, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin. Most Bible scholars would tell us that she probably was a young teenage girl, probably no more than 15 or 16 years of age. This young virgin uh, girl's name was Mary. And the Bible tells us here that in verse 28, the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be since I have not been intimate with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived. He's giving her this report to encourage her to believe in this miraculous work that God has promised was going to take place with her. He said, there's been another miracle that has transpired. You've got a relative by the name of Elizabeth. And she could not have a child. And she's now well up in years. She has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. So it was known that she could not have a child. Verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. All right, and you talk about Mary giving her will to the Lord. Here it is in verse 38. I am the Lord's slain. My will is consumed with the will of my master. I am the Lord's servant, the Lord's slave, doulos in the Greek text. I am the Lord's slave, his servant. May it be done to me according to your word. And then the angel left her. I don't know how information travels in heaven. I don't know how the angels communicate. I don't know what they know and what they don't know. I don't know how they get all their information. But I can just imagine this angel coming into the gates of glory and is heralded with this big, angelic, boisterous voice. Good news, everybody! She's accepted the assignment. That's what Mary did. Be it unto me according to your word. I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. I'm the servant of the Lord. She surrendered her will to God. Is it not true that God's will is to be our fully embraced purpose in life? Is, that not, is it not true that, that God's purposes are our calling? And then we are to give ourselves fully to what the Lord wants out of our lives. You know, and, and the details, the particulars of our life, they vary, you know, with each of us. God wants me to do some things today that He's not going to ask you to do. And He's going to want some things out of you that He's not going to, to ask for me. But generally speaking, oh, we, 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 we uh, have that great similarity of calling and that God is to be glorified in our lives and that we live for the kingdom of God. We live for the glory of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We live for His purposes. We live to give God worship. 
time we live for the advancement of his kingdom. We live so that men and women and boys and girls will come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And that God will be glorified in the lives of people all over this world. That's why we live. We live seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Is that not our purpose in living? Well, is your will surrender to that? Is your heart surrendered to that? Are you embracing the will of God? And then as far as the details of your life, the particulars of your personal life is concerned, are you saying to the Lord, Lord, I want you to write the story of my life and I yield myself to you and as I make my, my plans, as I set my goals, as I determine my course, God, I, I yield it all to you and wherever I'm off track, God, get me on track wherever I'm making a wrong choice. Correct me in my wrong thinking. And Lord, I want your perfect will to be done in me. Oh, there's to be that abandonment of ourselves to the will of God. Being called by God for, for this relationship that we have in Him. To grow in the Lord and to worship Him and obey Him and carry out His mission. And then to have a particular life that God would would put before us daily. That must be what our heart embraces. Now I want to point out to you that when Mary said, I'm the servant of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word, she was making a choice that would be very costly. Very costly. Mary as a, as a young, single girl to be given birth to a child, to go through those months of bearing that child. Oh, listen, what, what awkwardness would that be? You know, I don't know everything that was flashing in Mary's mind. The Bible doesn't tell us at this time that she's had this angelic encounter. But I guarantee you this, it wasn't long after that angel was gone, if it wasn't in the midst of her conversation with that angel, she's thinking, what am I, what's my family? And how in the world, you know, there's no promise recorded for us in this text whatsoever that don't worry about Joseph, I'm going to go knock on his door next. You know, there's, there's nothing about that whatsoever. And so, you know, here's, here's this young lady and she's going to pay the price of reputation and she's going to, to pay the, the price of responsibility. All the responsibility. She knew that this is a major, major deal and she did not know all that was going to be involved. But yet she said this, whatever God wants, God gets. Whatever the Lord has for me, I embrace it with all my heart. You know, we're living in a day and time in which people want such a convenient religion, right? And they don't want to pay a price to the will of the Lord. They don't, want, they don't want to give financially. They don't want to give of their life. They, they, don't, they don't want to, you know, it, it, Jesus is to be a tack on. The idea is, you know, I'll, I'll try to live a, a good life. I'll try to do well. I, I, don't, I don't want to be a bad person in life. And I'm going to even try to bring Jesus in the mix of all that's, that's the way the people think. You know, just kind of mix Jesus in. Well, not all of Jesus, but the parts of Jesus that we like. And not too demanding of us. We'll, we'll bring all of that in to the mix. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Jesus said, if you follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross daily and come after me. Biblical Christianity. Biblical discipleship has a cross. Amen. Actually, it has two crosses. It has the cross of Christ, which makes our discipleship possible through the forgiveness and grace of God. And then there is the bearing of our own cross, in which we die to our own ambition, our own self-governed life, and we do like Mary. We give our life to the Lord for whatever He wants out of us. Would you bring Jesus the gift 
of your surrendered will today? Would you, would you just package up your heart and your life and give it to Jesus and say, Jesus, it's yours. I, I, I give you my will. Not only is there the gift of, of will, you see that in Mary, but there's also a gift of witness. A gift of witness. We, we see further here in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, that that's what the angels did. Mary gave her will, the angels gave their witness. In verse 8, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people today a Savior, who is Messiah, Christos, Christ, the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a feeding trough. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. The angels came and, and bore witness. The angel came and bore witness to the shepherds and then was joined by a host of heavenly angels as they gave witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you, are you giving Jesus your witness? Are you one who, who shares the person and the purpose of Jesus? That's what the angels did. They talked about the person of Jesus and they talked about the purpose of Jesus as they spoke to the shepherds. And they were rejoicing and glorifying God over who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about. Now notice, the angels did not come to the outskirts of Bethlehem and build a church building and send out flyers to everybody and tell them in those flyers, we've got a great message up here on this hill. And you folks ought to come and hear our message. No, the, the angels went where the shepherds were. Amen. And they, they weren't invited by the shepherds either. But they went where the shepherds were. And they gave witness. And the church is, is not a come and see or come and hear. But the biblical church is to be going to where the world is. Amen. Going to where lost people are. Going to the shepherds of our day and sharing with them who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about. Just like these angels did. We are called to go with the gospel. The direction of their witness, they went to the shepherds and they declared their witness. Today a Savior who is Christ the Lord, Messiah the Lord, was born for you. Born for you. That's what we do. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5 that we are not proclaiming ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord. We go to men and women and boys and girls, whether it be in Walmart or Macy's or Dillard's or in the schools or on your job, in the neighborhood, wherever it is, and we tell people, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born for you. Amen. And He died for you on the cross that you can be saved by His death, and by the power and authority of His resurrection. So you've got the direction of their witness. They went to the shepherds. You've got the declaration of their witness. They talked about Jesus. And then you've got the delight of their witness. It was a joyful message. I tell you, you're not sharing the gospel correctly if you don't share the gospel with a big smile. Amen. I mean, this is good news. Yeah. Some people, you know, when they're witnessing, they act like they've got bad news. We don't have bad news. We've got good news. Amen. Oh, you wouldn't want Jesus to 
be your savior, wouldn't you? Yeah. Have you ever seen a witness like that? No, no, we've got glorious news. We've got great news. And I tell you, good news beckons to be told. Amen. If you understand that you've really got good news about something, you don't, you don't have to have anybody twist your arm to get you to tell about it. Right? You, you rejoice over that. When something great has happened to you, you want other people to know about it. Now, I tell my, I tell my age, but I tell you when our first daughter was born that uh, this old boy had a pocket full of dimes. And, uh, and we, used the, we used the pay telephone in the hospital telling that good news. And I didn't care whether they wanted to hear my phone call or not. I was going to let some folks know. Amen. And that's, that's the way it ought to be with us. Oh, how, how does that compare with the good news of, of the fact that we have a Savior for our lost, hell-bound souls? That Jesus has come to be our Savior and Lord. Oh, the delight of our witness. He, the angel says, I tell you, good news of great joy, right? Good news of great joy. So are you giving the Lord Jesus your will? Are you giving Jesus your witness? One more. Are you giving Jesus your worship? Oh, we need to bring the gift of worship before the Lord. We need to bring the gift of worship. That's what the Magi did. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem. You know, that wasn't a hop on Barton trip. Either. That wasn't a get on Delta trip. That, that wasn't a ride in a Mercedes trip. This was not an easy journey. This was a, a, a long journey, most likely coming from Iraq. And, uh, you know, dusty, desert, rough terrain, dangerous travel. You don't, you don't make that kind of journey with gold, frankincense, and myrrh with all those thieves that you can be riding by. They didn't have armed guards or anything. Here they go. Why? They're on mission to worship the king. Yes, amen. They're going to worship. So wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Who are these men? Who are these men? Well, I will remind you of Daniel and, and all those Hebrews who, who spent many, many years in Iraq. And uh, we don't know. These guys could have been Jewish. We don't know. These could have been those who, who down through the years uh, learned to be those who would Fear God. There are a lot of those who try to make these be pagan uh, cult practitioners and all of that. I, I tell you, just don't just don't go too far in your speculations and just go with what the Bible says. Amen. If God wanted us to know more about who these people were, He would tell us in the Bible. And so just just go with it. Right? Here's the thing: you do need to know these people knew that somebody had been born who was more special than anybody else in the world. They knew somebody had been born who was deserving of their worship. Amen. And so they came and they bowed before Him and they brought gifts fit for the greatest of all kings. And they bowed before this baby to do that. Isn't that so? I, I don't know. I, I just kind of have an idea. They had a good understanding of who they'd come to on that day. Uh, the, middle, the Middle Ages, uh, the... Uh, the church named them Melchior, Balthazar, and Casper. You know? And they say, well, there's gold, frankincense, and myrrh, so there must have been three of them. And we'll give them these three names. But we don't know how many of them. There was at least two, because it does say wise men. But there could have been 15 or 20. We don't know how many of them. They've, named, they've given three because of the three gifts, but who knows? Who knows how many there were? But the thing is, they came and they came and they worshiped the Lord. The, the word here that's translated worship, we have come 
with the intent. We've come with the purpose. We've come with the resolve to worship Him. Is the, is the word proskuneo. It means to bow before reverentially. It conveys the idea of to bow and to give a kiss before with reverence and awe. And so here are these, these wise men, these royalty, men of royalty coming and bowing before Jesus and presenting their treasures in reverence before Him. I don't ask you today, are you religious? I don't ask you today, are you regular in church attendance? I ask you this morning, do you worship the Lord? Do you really worship? The Lord. Do you bow not just your body, but do you bow your heart before Jesus? And do you really worship Him? These guys didn't get up on Sunday morning and check the weather forecast before they decided whether or not they were going to worship the Lord. They didn't look at one another and say, Well, do you have a runny nose this morning? I think we might have better stay home. You know, there was none of that. And when you and I ever catch a glimpse of the Lord, I tell you, we're going to give Him worship. Nobody going to stop us. Amen. Even if they don't sing the kind of music in church that I like, it's not going to stop me from worshiping the Lord. Amen. Right? Even if the pastor doesn't dress the way I think you ought to dress, I'm still going to worship the Lord. And they, they, can, they can say we're going to stop having worship services at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. We're going to have them at midnight. You know what? Amen. I'm going to worship the Lord. Why? He's worthy. Why? He's worthy. He's worthy. Oh, what a privilege it is to give the Lord worship. Yes, amen. I don't ask you what's under the tree. I ask you what's in your heart. What are the gifts that are in your heart for Jesus this year? Is it a surrendered will? Is it a dedicated witness? Is it a sincere worship? If those gifts for Jesus aren't in your heart, then you're not ready for Christmas. You're not ready, you're not ready for Christmas. You're not ready for today. You're not ready for tomorrow. You're not ready for next week. I tell you, that's the way to live. Amen. That's the way to live for the one who came and gave himself as God's gift to us. Let's stand together and bow.